Shelley Carney and Toby Eunice bring you New Mexico Day Trips. Visit national parks, monuments, state parks, and historical sites. See the amazing and unique desert vistas of the land of enchantment and walk through the visitor centers, museums, and Pueblo ruins with us. Enjoy the sights, sounds, and flavors of New Mexico. Let's have an adventure. Here we are. <laughs> that took a while. Hello and welcome to um, the show, New Mexico Day Trips. <clears throat> I'm Shelley Carney. And I'm Toby Eunice. Thanks for joining <laughs> us tonight. What? I don't know. Is my, oh, I know what it is. Go ahead. Okay. So tonight we are uh, going to talk about where we went last week. Grants, New Mexico. Grants is a little town in you know, along I-40, uh, and when you're going from Albuquerque to Gallup and on into Arizona, pass right by it. And uh, sometimes you go, hmm, I wonder what's there. And, but we never did stop before. So Toby and I decided to go there on purpose. And what, and, uh, what did you discover about yourself? <laughs> about myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. About oh, myself. Yes. There we go. Uh, I figure I'm so damn short. That, uh, you know, I don't know. What did you discover about yourself? What What did <laughs> What did M. Scott Momaday help you discover about yourself? Um. Well, if we look at his quote that he that we both like so much, it's, uh, "I am who I am because I was there." Mm -hmm. Um. That where we go has a lot of influence and uh it matters you mm -hmm. know to to who we are mm -hmm. as to where we've been and where we've places we've seen you know people we've talked to things we've done all it all of that influences who you are influences who you are yeah i'm a big believer in that because i think uh, a lot of who i am is the result of the places I've been. Well, yeah. And you say, you know, you can tell a difference between two different people who are even of the same family and near the same age, mm -hmm. but one has been, you know, has lived all over the world mm -hmm. and one has pretty much, you know, stayed in a homebody, stayed yeah. at home or in the Southwest. For mm -hmm. instance, my son, Jared, you know, he's lived in Arizona and he's lived in New Mexico and now he's in Indiana, but, his uh, cousin, Tomas, uh -huh. has lived, you know, all over Africa and Europe, and he's lived in the United States. He's lived in Japan. So he's a lot more worldly, I think. He's got, you know, a bigger worldview. And, and there's a certain amount of confidence that comes along with that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. And it's an education in itself that you just, you just know more in, about life and yeah. about the world. I'm going to change screens because I like the colors on this one over here. Can I do that? No, I can't do that. I already made a choice. You can have both of them on one screen. I I, may, I actually made a choice not to do that because I didn't, I made the mistake last time of sharing our screen screen, which oh, is not what I wanted yeah, to you do. You don't want to do that because yeah. then we get double up yeah. on our audio. We get that mirror thing. And that, that double up audio sounded pretty bad. It did. <laughs> We don't want to do that anymore. All right. So tonight we're going to be talking about grants, but specifically the first place that we went in grants was the New Mexico Mining Museum. And it was a great place to learn about mining, but it's specifically uranium mining. And the uranium mining that's gone on in grants started in about the 50s. 1950s and it's gone up and down boom bust it's a boom bust kind of a town depending on the price of uranium mm -hmm. uh, so when uranium is selling well and it's priced high and in need then it's uh then it's a boom kind of time for grants and right now it's not that kind of time so it's more of a bust kind of time for them and there's a couple of things that tells you about it being a bust town a bust in a town whose primary source of 
uh, productivity is uranium, and that is uh, uranium prices are down because demand for uranium, uh, uranium is down. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, uh, uranium is not being used as a source of energy anymore because of the dangers associated with it. We had uh, a couple of faux pas, very dangerous faux pas, and I think that made uh, people worried about what the potential was. Second thing is we're not producing as many armaments as uh, we used to. Uh, Russia's armaments production is way, way down. China's is way, way down. Ours, our armaments level at about the same, but we're not producing new armaments, which some people question. But uh, so the demand for uranium is down. Uranium, processed uranium is what produces uh, yellow cake, and yellow cake is what is used to produce both uranium in terms of the energy sector and uranium in terms of the weapons sector. So we wanted to... Uh talk about the mining museum when it's open how much it costs all the you know the details of it um and then we'll also talk about uranium mining in grants and is it still going on and it is something that they can still do but they're they're not doing it right now uh, -huh. uh the uranium mining because the price is too low to justify the cost of doing yeah, business yeah yeah yeah. Um, the museum itself is open from 9 till 5, Monday through Friday, and 9 to 4 on Saturdays, closed, closed on, on Sundays. Sundays. Right. And the museum next door to it, the Cibola County, C Cibola County museum, museum, is only open on Saturdays by appointment. So <laughs> the best day to go if you want to go to both is on a Saturday. On a Saturday. Yeah. Now, I do want to point out that there's going to be some oddities in terms of the way that I edited this video, because we actually went to two different uh, locations on this one trip out towards Grant. Uh, and the, the locations were very different from one another. In one case, we had the Uranium, New Mexico Mining Museum focused on uranium. And then the other was a national park. Uh, I'm sorry, a national monument. Um, whose focus was the geology of lava flow. It's called El Malpais. And I felt like, A, they were different enough that they didn't, I think they would have been dilute had we put them in the same show. So we decided to make two shows out of it. And it turned out kind of like that's even what the editing did to it. This is, you know, for us, a full length feature, just discussing the museum. And then next week, uh, we'll be discussing the visit to the other location, which is south of Grants, um, and that's the El Malpais uh, National Monument and also the El Malpais National Conservation Area. And what makes that interesting for us is the National Monument is run by the National Park Service, no drony drones. The uh, National Conservation Area is run by the BLM, drony drone, drony drone. So uh, we did get some drone footage. And we were almost killed by speeding police officers. Oh, so. we were not almost killed. No cause. Although we'll probably say that in our shorts. So look for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We will. We need to make a short out of that. Yeah. Because it really was pretty good. Before we go on to the movie tonight, um, I would appreciate it if uh, before you leave tonight or before you uh, finish watching this program, like our video, YouTube likes it when you like our video, share with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your business associates, the entirety of your social media networks. And that way we can grow the channel. And finally, if, and what's your goal for this year? 25,000 subscribers. So months. get out there and tell your friends. So this would be the ideal time to <laughs> click on that subscribe button. So if you're not already a subscriber to one of our 80 subscribers, by the way, are That's we right. yeah. 80 today. Um, make it a point to subscribe to our channel. That way, um, I don't know, what, what is it that happens? Subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications oh, whenever right. we go live or produce and upload a new video. And, and we're, we've been doing, our, our plan is to produce at least one short a day. If you don't know what shorts are, just go to YouTube, enter shorts, and you will have a complete selection of all the things that interest you in your life. So they're a lot of fun to produce. And it's actually put a whole new perspective on pre-production and actual production of the videos that we do before we go to the editing phase. So I'm very excited about it. I, it's hard to make me excited about tech. I'll take that back. Technology excites me. Okay, please like, share, and subscribe. And it also helps if you have a comment to make it below, either to tonight when we're doing our live stream or when the video is uh, uh, on already up on YouTube. 
make a comment. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Tell us um, uh, um, tell where, us you, want where us you want to us go. to go. That would be a good one, huh? In New Mexico. Yeah, in New Mexico, although we are going to make trips out with a, with a boat. Not too much in the winter, though. I no, mean, right now in the winter, we're going to be doing some indoorsy things like museums. Uh, Saturday, we're going to be going to the Ghost Ranch, and there's a museum there. That two of them. Two museums there we'll be enjoying uh, in indoors <laughs> while this cold weather is here. Two museums and a library, apparently. So that's probably going to be two more shows. So, yeah. Yeah, at least. Yeah. Because and uh, last week we got together with some friends who are starting up a newspaper for advising the people of New Mexico things to do around the state, but most especially in Albuquerque, but also around the state. And Toby and I are going to be writing an article about where we visited recently for that newspaper. So we're pretty excited about that. But Shelly is going to be writing. I'm going to be taking pictures. Yes, we're going to, it's a joint effort. It's a joint effort. She has her, she has the things that she but does we well. we believe that our first article will be about grants and especially the mining museum. So today's yeah. show is very important for that. It's a poignant show. Yes. Okay, I'm going to share some pictures. Can I share some pictures? You do that. Picture time. All right. So um, I will post, I'll do it right now as a matter of fact. Let me get that link copy it i will post that into the comments right there there you go so you can see them there yeah. all right uh let's start with uh, the help of uh, google maps uh, we start from here bernalillo and we drive down i-25 until we connect with i-40 actually uh, we didn't do that we went down this route. We went down mm -hmm. Coors route. Because we didn't you picked do the I-25. Because, yeah. yeah, this is actually for my house. But Shelly lives right about here by this volcano thing. And, I'm uh, one of the sisters. So it's, uh, <laughs> you know, that's a place we should go sometime. The, the what is it, five sisters? What are they? Something like that. Yeah. And then you head west on I-40. You go through a lot of geology. Like there's a lot of roadside geology and I have a book called uh, New Mexico's roadside geology and it just loves this route. Like you can stop anywhere and get rhyolites and agates and uh, fossils. Uh, just, you know, all Lots you have to do is rocks. pull over. Yeah. A lot of red rocks. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and Grants is right here. This area is important because this is Mount Taylor. It once, uh, once a very active volcano still, it doesn't rumble or anything now. Uh, but you can tell it was a volcano, and it's a very popular area for a lot of rock hounds. The last time it, it erupted was 5,000 years 5, ago. 5,000 years so ago, that's it's right. still fairly new as a volcano that isn't erupting. It's so, dormant. And the New Mexico Mining Museum is in the town of Grants. And the other location that we went to was this area right here, that area that's uh, black. That's because it's all uh, basalt. It's all uh, lava flow. Uh, and they call it the El Mal País, the Badlands. Um, and there's a little road here dividing. You, you can see right along here. And this side, uh, so part of this is on Acoma Pueblo land. But eventually you get to the um, El Mal País National Conservation Area, which is run by the BLM. Uh, and there's a road called the Narrows right there, where on one side you have these beautiful uh, sandstone uh, cliffs, and bluffs. on the other side, pardon me, they call bluffs. Them bluffs. Yeah, they don't call them. They don't call them mesas, do they? They bluffs. call them bluffs. Yeah, and then on the other side, you have El Malpais. And I've got some when when we do this, I've got some drone footage that I shot from about I'm going to say 10 or 15 feet above the lava flow, and you can see why they call it. It is impassable. There are a couple of routes that the Native American, the early Native Americans found that are still used to this day. You could actually, there is a hike that will get you from Acoma to Zuni Pueblo through El Malpais. And that those were routes that were developed by the Native Americans and used by the Spanish. And if you tune in next week, I'm sure Toby will tell you all of this again. Today we're talking about the mining museum. Okay, now. mining museum. All right, sorry. I got that. Okay. Poof. 
you see that? You're the one that decided to split it in half. I know, no, no, no. You're focus absolutely right. Focus on the right. mining museum. So this is the mining museum. This is an aerial shot. This is not a drone shot, by the way. Uh, this is off Google Earth, the mining museum. Parking is over here. This is this area right here is the um, Cibola County Museum, the one that's only open Saturdays. Saturdays by appointment. They don't show it here, but that little track, that empty track, has a caboose on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was taken a long time ago because that caboose has been there, I know, uh, for at least three years because I watched a video that another guy had made on this particular area that goes back. Where's my little arrow here? Uh, so Shelly took this shot, and I really appreciate it because it gives you a sense of how chunky I really am. <laughs> like, the little, little fat guy. Anyway, no, actually, this is the point. The, the reason she took this shot is because she knows how much effort we go through to produce the best possible co content for you guys. You got and this what, reflection of you in the hood. Oh, of that's truck, very stylish. See? I hadn't seen that. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> so this is where I pull off uh, off of I-40 in this case and someplace that's safe. I'm not right on the road. Uh, I wait until we find an exit, and then I find the safest place on the exit. And I mount our action camera. In this case, um, it's a DJI Action 3. And that lets us get those, what I call the hood cam shots. And then there's a second mount right there. These are suction cup mounts made by, actually, they're made by GoPro. Uh, but they're very good. If you want a suction cup mount, go with the GoPro ones. There's a bit. There's really two ways you can make these mounts. One is suction cup and the other is a magnet. Magnets are okay, but I, they get slippy every once in a while. But the, these suction, these, the uh, GoPro suction mount, which is about 40 bucks a piece, uh, is worth every penny of it. This mount here is a second one, and that mount is for a five, six-hour battery that we leave up on the front of the hood with the uh, DJI so we don't have to keep replacing the battery because sometimes we leave it, you know, the whole, the entire trip. So we have plenty of footage. You can see this line right here. See that thing right there? That thing right there is a very thin wire that I hook to cable. the uh, cable. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's very thin. You know, it's a six strand cable and it has a break weight of 25 pounds. And I attach the first, I, I attach it to both the mounts and then I attach it to my uh, windshield wiper. <laughs> But what, what, how long ago was that? Was that, that was when we were on the turquoise trail? Turquoise trail. <laughs> and so we were on the turquoise trail. You'll see, uh, I also, we mount the camera uh, up inside. So that's when you see us driving, you see one shot is us in the, in the uh, cab of the truck, and the other is the, the, the um, hood cam, right, with a road. And we were going the turquoise trail. And this camera, the suction, it's not a, unfortunately, it's not a. Uh, well, you had it on the dash, not on the window. Oh, right. And the dash thing gave up. Yeah. It, it, was a, it was a glued one. It yeah. wasn't a magnetic or a and suction cup. Over. And it fell over. <laughs> and I went to catch it and I hit the uh, windshield wiper <laughs> stock. And so my windshield wipers went up. And when it went up, the wire <laughs> took thing and the windshield wiper was sticking. <laughs> Up in the sky. It's gone crazy. And she was just laughing her ass off. It was so funny. Like, <laughs> oh my God, what happened? <laughs> so the but here the good news is the wire did what it was supposed to. It it stayed. The funny part was well, the, it went out. Yeah, because of, the wire it was trying to swipe and then it just went out yeah. and kind of got stuck there and oh, it was pretty limbo. Funny. Anyway, that's me putting the camera up. But we uh, didn't get a picture of that. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of uh a lot pull of over pulling pretty, over pull and over getting real the, quick, fix figuring that. out. So one of the things about the uranium mine is that they were, as they were digging, they were finding these paleontology, paleontology finds as well. And this is a leg bone of a, was it a T-Rex? Apatosaurus. Apatosaurus. Uh, uh, one of those big, tall, uh, vegetarian uh, dinosaurs. Uh, but it was found in the mine, and these guys were smart enough, these miners were smart enough to make sure that if they found something that had uh, paleontological paleontological significance, they would protect it and uh, bring it out of the mine. So the, the nice thing about this museum, and I may have said it uh, in the summary, it, it's, um, it's not only about mining, it's about the area's geology, it's about the area's economy, it's about some of the paleontology. And they have their displays, as you'll see in the video. 
um, will sh share a lot of that with you. So uh, this is a shot of Shelley, and this is in uh, the replica of the uranium mine that they built. And um, they let you take a tour down uh, through that mine. So Which we'll see in the video. We'll, we'll see in the video. I won't go through it. This is a um, drill bit, basically this huge drill bit that's run by a combination of water and electricity. And um, and basically, they turn it flat into the ground, and they start going downwards, and it can drill one foot a minute with all those uh, gears. And they have diamond, those bits have diamond tips on them. Or they did before it wore yeah, out. Yeah, before it wore out. <laughs> they yeah. put it on display there. Right. So this is what sits over a mine after it's uh, starting to develop because it goes straight down. This is not this is not sideways mining. Oh. What? I thought this was to call in the aliens. I saw the top thing. Oh, yeah. No, like that will afterwards when they put it up here, they decided that they were going to start using it to call in the aliens. Oh, okay. So this is what sits over the mine, over the hole, over the shaft. Uh, and that's what's used to raise the worker, raise and lower the workers, raise and lower the ore, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So now once you're down in the mine, I, I was amazed. They had a uh, a cutaway map of a mine. And once you're down to the where the main, uh, what do they call it, the streak of uranium is, uh, the they go lateral instead of down. And then they start building all these other things. There are like there are layers of mine uh, laterally Which on top of each other. Which you'll see in the model that yeah. you see in the yeah in the model. Video. There was a model there that this guy built. It's pretty amazing. So we went there. I didn't take this picture, so I don't know what it is. That is a concretion, concretion. of sandstone. It was outside the uh, the, the Cibola County oh. um, Museum. Museum up front. Yeah. And there's the door ah, so the that door. you can see it's open Saturdays only from nine to two by appointment. By appointment. And there's the phone numbers. So oh. if you want to go to the Siebel County Historic Museum, that's what you do. Oh, I didn't notice there's a church on the other side. Did you across you the street yeah, yeah. behind me? Okay. So we didn't take a there's lot of a pictures. There's a person right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right there. See the, there's the church and there's the person and open the door. Let's see all the people. What's it? Isn't there a whole thing? Mm -hmm. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. Oh, okay. <laughs> see, I was a Catholic once, a long, long time ago. All right, you ready for video? I am. Okay. So if you guys have any questions, make sure you ask them in the chat. We'll be happy to answer them via chat. Um, we'll try not to talk during the video. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn off our microphones once we do. Uh, but if we have any comments to make or if you have a question, uh, we'll I don't know why we can't talk during the video. They can go watch the video separately if they want. That's quiet. true. I actually, I accidentally uploaded the video. Well, no, I uploaded the video last night and I was going to schedule it to launch at 1230 tomorrow. And somehow I missed the date. So it launched at 1230 a day. It's up there. If you, all you want to do is watch the video. It's already available. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Let me. So we're going to tour the museum. And it's, uh, here we go. All right, we're on our way to Grant's. Grant's is about 44 miles away, and we're going to the, uh, what you call it, visitor center? No, mining museum. The New Mexico Mining Museum at Grant's. Yeah. Santa Fe Avenue. Is that what we're on? Yeah. 
Turn right onto Iron oh. Avenue. Then the destination is on your right. Okay. Oh, that's a cool. So Saturday here we are. Bridge. Like Turning on to uh, the Iron train Avenue. The the There's, There's a the caboose. park. Mm. A caboose. There's the mining Church museum. Destination is on your right. ah, Doesn't yes. look like there's Endellers. parking there. Miners building. Arrived. Okay, we've got a sign over here that tells us that there's the parking museum. here. I did stop at this sign. No, it doesn't look like it, but I did stop. Briefly. One of these days they're going to have like send a bunch of police after building. me for all the stop signs that I'm. A couple of little parks. Was well, a nice park there if you have uh, kids so or something. In there? Mm -hmm. You need to entertain there. them. Yeah. All right, we get all our warm warms on and not too warm warms though. I guess we'll be indoors. Yeah, we'll be indoors. Just our best. Okay, we have arrived at the. Uh, Museums and grants, as you can see in front of us, there's the Cibolo County History Museum. Our mining museum is over there, uh, so we'll be heading there to take a look at it, and uh, we'll take you and with us. There's a little park with uh, some kind of big equipment from mining. Some mining equipment back there. Yeah. Yeah, there seemed to be equipment all the way around the park from the videos that I watched. And just across the road from the uh, railroad tracks. All right, so we're here. Uh, really we'll take you with that. us and get some uh, video for you there. I'll put the chesty on. How's that? All right. Okay, we're going to go into the mining museum in Grants. Is that far enough or no? <laughs> we're going in the mining museum in Grants. I've never been into Grants before. I've always passed by it. Looking around. That's just me, not the we'll whole this part. Let's turn it around. So and there's see the park. some of the mining equipment that's out here. There's the front door. Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Should be open. All right. Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. New Mexico Mining Museum, Chamber of Commerce, Visitor Center. This is all the things. Except for a muffler. Sure. Oh. Oh. Motorcycle. <laughs> Thank you. On this in between holiday. Yeah. Is it a good time to be here? Yes. Is the shaft open? Yes. It is? Yes. All right. The shaft. The shaft. I didn't know. That. And we actually have a tour down there right now. I mean, someone touring. Well, we'll wait until they're done. That way we can look around up here. And you're welcome to look around at everything up here. And then uh, the tour of the museum is $5 for adults, um, $30 for seniors. But you guys aren't seniors. Oh, we don't like admitting we're seniors. Depends on the age I, you consider seniors. Well, with the girls, when we, they first put that price, we're going to about two years. And then I, I get the senior discount. So, yeah, it comes up pretty quick. <laughs> Are you a state park facility? No. Okay. How old is a senior? Senior is um, really a child's age, is what one guy told me here. <laughs> it's all right. Just charge me the same as a child, he tells me. <laughs> uh, but it's 60. 60 and up. Oh, dang it. You don't make I the got senior. One more year so to go. One, ad <laughs> one, ad one adult and one senior. $8. Receipt? <clears throat> no, I don't need it. Thank you. Unless you guys need it for me to go down. I'm going to turn this off. It's yeah, you can turn that. Um, when you, you can take a left and tour all the exhibits on the very top about mining and everything in this area. Mm -hmm. We have um, ancient pottery room in our boardroom, which you're welcome to go in there and take a look at all of that uh, in there. Everything up here, the exhibits, uh, there's an elevator that will lower you to the mining exhibit underground. And it's, it's a replica, but it is... We were just looking at pictures of the mines right now, and it's so identical to these pictures. Can I um, see them? Yeah, we sure can. We're actually thinking of getting us a nice photo booth for up here. Oh, yeah. Photo booth thing. Cool. So anyway, you'll go underground, um, and I thought it was good that I put them through the chest. Push the buttons, and it'll guide you. Except they're all upside down. Piece with nope. information, and then back out another way that is pretty cool. 
So, uh, with so the guided buttons, it helps. I'm seeing the restroom there over here. Yes. Right <laughs> that one is upside. Your microphone is still on, by the way. You want me to take it off? Uh, yeah, probably if you're going in the ladies' room. Well, that's okay. <laughs> we'll just pick it up. We'll pick it up. Yeah. yeah. It's wireless, so it just follows her around. It's completely upside. So down. I had one mm -hmm. question, and that is, if you're working in a uranium mine, will you be affected by the uranium? I mean, were they affected, the miners eventually affected by right that? Right now there's miners that are taken care of through the Department of Labor, uh -huh. and it was for lung exposure. Mm, rather than, than yeah. radi There's, radiation. They, they don't have a lot of recorded radiation. Uh, Interesting. Or, I mean, as far as, like, uh, cancers from. Mm -hmm. But they have the lung disease, and, and that was mostly from not wearing respirators and such. Oh. Back in the day when the safety is different now. Than right, was yeah. Then. Yeah, and my dad's a miner. And are they still mining for uranium not in this area? Excuse there's, me, sir. There's no uranium here right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but they are mining coal in the area. I mean, there's still uranium. They're just not mining it. Right. The market. The market. Mm. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Jack. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. Merry Christmas. Nice. <laughs> so, um, so, they have a very nice display so, um, of uh, both geologic and archaeological uh, displays. This one that's in front of us is archaeological. And you can buy a handful of polished stones right there. That's some really beautiful specimens. Very diverse. Some of the equipment that they used. Oh, they even have paleontological, pa paleontology, paleontology exhibits. <laughs> paleontological. There you go. Thank you. Entological. You can see the caboose across the street. So do you have a challenge coin for the uh, museum? Uh, we do. Um, we so where are you from? I'm from uh, Albuquerque, uh, uh, Bernalillo. Yeah. None of your damn um, business. Yeah, in our machine, uh, we're supposed to get maintenance. You will have San Rafael with a What do you see? Uh, this little um, model to scale. And it won a, a fair competition. Uh -huh. Made in 1982 by Abe Medina Claim Operator, dedicated to the miners both living and deceased. Very cool. Oh, that's the other use they can. Nuclear powered. Uh, submarine? Well, not only submarines, but some of the surface ships are also nuclear powered. The carriers are all nuclear powered. So that's another way to use it. Gamma analyzer. So my uncle Albert, who worked at uh, who worked at Los Alamos uh, for most of his life, uh, used to have the kind of equipment that they'd use up there. They'd always bring home a, a Geiger counter and some piece of uranium so he could show us the sound that it made. You know, I'm sure there was nothing legal about it, but. It looked like that. How to find uranium. They gave us free buttons for our vests that say we went underground. Shelly's wearing hers right there. I didn't get mine till later. Zuni mine. Floor spar. Or a wagon train getting fresh water from the pool. 
Wander, we are always surprised and amazed at the variety of locations uh, to visit in New Mexico. Just, we haven't even scratched the surface. You could spend the whole day in here just reading the things yeah. and yeah. watching the videos oh, yeah. and yeah. touring the museum. So this is... Uh... Oh, you dropped your phone there. Is that your new phone? No, this is the old one. The old uh, iPhone 14. <laughs> no bueno. No bueno. Must be how you correct the gorilla glass on this one. So I ordered, I didn't have the new gorilla glass. I ordered some for you. El Moro. This is one of the, uh, one of the graffiti on the wall at El Moro. Oh. And if I remember correctly, oh. Oñate. I thought Juan de Oñate. This was the one that Juan de Oñate left. We'll yeah. see it when we go to El Moro. <sighs> so they still use the more archaic Anasazi to de describe the ancients. Anasazi toys. And the guy with, that was making the presentation here, kept calling the Mogollon the Mongolian. Fossil dinosaur leg bone? And then uh, 300 million years ago to the to the dinosaurs, oh, 200 million years ago. And then the 300 year, 300 million shallow seas, the Western Sea, isn't that what it was called? Yeah, that the, was yeah, the Western, uh, Western sea. Seaway. Remember we talked about it when we were searching for fen Snail treasure. Show. It's got gold on it. More equipment that's used in mining. So do we just go down the elevator by ourselves or are we supposed to go with somebody? Yeah. So we can go down the elevator on our own, is that right? Yes. Okay. With the buttons? Yeah, they're audio recording. Okay, thank you. Oh, here we are. Nuclear sub. Is El Magruder. El Magruder. El Magurdis. Uranium. Ceramics and metallurgical industries, uranium oxides added to glass, to produce colors ranging from pale yellow to distinctive green. Uh, ceramic wear. Coloring agent. So you did a really good job with that selfie thing. I know it was hard, but it was worse. Sometimes I had to switch hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to hold this music. Like a pan. Cool. Free music. Radioactivity. It didn't pick right. up on it on the upload. I think I didn't we're ready to go down into the uh, mine. Well, it's kind of jazzy, so. It's uh, what's Push his name? So I'm going to turn on this light. Turn this to wide angle. You should have been filming what was behind us because the go. doors Down are boring. Mine shaft. Did you press? No. M for mine. M for mine. Is that what it is? S for. I don't know. What is S? Shaft. Surface. <laughs> Surface. Okay. Because when you're in a mine. That's where you go up the surface. Ah, where when you're in. So remember, this is a, a replica <laughs> mine. Wow. Did you pick up the wow in descript? Mm-hmm. So, station one. Yeah. Is right here. We're supposed to push the button. Right? speaker is use your microphone. Use your microphone to point to the speaker. To do what? To point to the speaker. Where's the speaker? Press the button. Oh. My name is Clark, and I worked in the uranium area here in the Grinch area 
from 1957 until 1994. I'm going to talk to I you also today about Fleming. the underground station Maybe. area where you are located at this time. <laughs> this is the area at the shaft where all material that comes underground is handled, such as timber, wire rope for slushers, explosives, and many other supplies. The employees also were conveyed to this location down the shaft in the cage in which you just stepped out of. Ore and waste was hoisted to the surface by means of special equipment called skips. These skips were usually counterbalanced. As the loaded skip was hoisted to the surface, the empty one was going down and its weight helped the hoist pull the loaded one to the surface. Please direct your attention to the items that are being illuminated. The small winch is called a tugger and was used to pull or remove material from the shaft conveyance called a cage. The ore car sitting here is classified as a 77 cubic foot car and would hold around four tons of ore. Over in the far corner is located a porta potty. These were strategically located in the active areas of the mine and generally were serviced on graveyard ship. In the immediate area of the station were located the settling basins and pump rooms for gathering and pumping the water that flowed into the mine and directed this water to the surface. Notice the metal drainage ditch in the middle of the drift. The ditch transported the water to the pumping facilities. Explosive magazines, supply storage, shops, and lunch rooms were also located nearby. What is this dealy? Well, I guess that closes the door. That's to no, open that not. open and close that door, which says must be kept closed. It's part of the tour, but I don't know where Station Two is. I guess probably on the way out we we come through mm. that door. I'm guessing. I'm I'm skipping ahead to the end of the book here. There's station two. Is that the red button is right there? No, that's station three. That's oh. a button over there. But this? That's not a button. Oh. Maybe two and three is one button. It's a bolt. My name is Hal, and I worked in the uranium industry 30 years. Distribution of all material in the mine was achieved by the use of locomotives and trains. The locomotive in front of you is a four-ton battery-powered locomotive that was capable of moving five or more ore cars from the production areas to the shaft. It was also used for transporting ground support material such as timbers, rock bolts, wire mesh, as well as explosives. Miners working long distances from the shaft were transported in specially built cars to and from their working places. It should be noted that the mines were also equipped with eight ton diesel locomotives, as well as rubber tired loaders, trucks, and other practice mining equipment. It's your microphone. Hello, I'm Jack. I have 28 years experience in the uranium mining industry at Ambrosia Lake. The steel chute being illuminated we used by the motorman to load the ore to the car for transportation to the main shaft. The control valve on the opposite rib was used to open and close the door of the chute and the ore car was loaded to the motorman's satisfaction. As the ore horizon was generally above the haulage level, the miner used gravity feed to assist him in loading the ore into the ore car. See, there were two people on there, two mm -hmm. and three. Lots of Christmas decorations. My name is David W. Ogden, Jr. 
I began working in the uranium mining industry in 1956 as a driller's helper, later worked as mill laborer, open pit and underground miner, underground mining supervisor, and finally chemical mining and surface reclamation. From the mine's stations or mining levels, haulage tunnels or drifts were advanced by drilling and blasting. The broken material was then removed by a mucking machine shown here. The miner would stand on the steel plate step and by moving the handles on the side of the machine, he would cause it to advance into the broken rock and then lift the bucket over the top of the machine and deposit the material into the ore car behind it. This would clean out the track drift face in preparation for another cycle of drilling and blasting. Please note the service lines overhead. The four inch pipe was used for distribution of compressed air. The two inch steel pipe was used to bring water into the mine for use in the drilling operations. There was also a red electrical line which was used to carry the electrical current to the loaded blast holes. The black electrical cable provided electric power to the fans, flushers, lighting, and other electrical equipment. Also please note the ground support provided by the bolts, square washers, and the chain link fencing evident in the area of the haulage drift. This combination of bolts and chain link fencing was used to stabilize the ground and reduce the chance of rock slabs falling and injuring personnel and or equipment. The bolts in the sides or ribs were four feet long with an expansion anchor or shell on the end of the bolt. They were torqued to a minimum of 140 foot-pounds. The bolts in the back were six feet long and these were torqued to 180 foot-pounds. A raise is a hole driven vertically to gain access to the raise, core horizon. A race. The raise you see here is a manway with ladders and a service compartment beside it, which That's was used for hoisting equipment such as flushers, flusher minute, buckets, not the same guy, ground no. support materials, and explosives to the ore horizon. Some raises were driven for ventilation purposes either for moving fresh air to working places or removing contaminated air to ventilation holes to be exhausted from the mine. Ventilation shafts or vent holes were used for exhaust or intake of atmospheric air, depending on the particular mine's ventilation requirements or plans. They were drilled from the surface with a drill rig and cased with steel to prevent caving. The diameter of the hole was engineered to transfer the optimum amount of air for a particular mine area and was typically at least four feet in diameter. Thousands of cubic feet of air per minute were transferred by a network of ventilation holes. As you leave this station, you will be leaving the haulage area and entering an area of the mine that represents the elevation where the ore is located. He did go on, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Super specific stuff that I didn't really need to know about foot pounds. But, but uh, <laughs> the torque. Torque. Yeah. Torque. The ceiling gets lower. <laughs> it even says. Uh, Oop. Uh, I can touch the ceiling. Ready? What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, I'm busy here touching the ceiling. <laughs> Did you push it right? Mm -hmm. Did I push it right? How hard can it? didn't make us. Uh, my name is Ernie Lucero, and I've had uh, 30 years in mining experience. The air was blocked out into pillars in preparation for the final step in, the, in this type of mining. The pillars are then drilled with a series of holes, which are then loaded with explosives and blasted. The broken oil was then moved to an ore pass with a three-drum electric winch called a slusher and a bucket. The removal of these pillars created a large opening that was called an open stope, or a ballroom similar to the one you see here, only larger. Some mines backfilled these stopes with sand after the pillars were removed 
to prevent large-scale caving. No one was allowed in these open slopes at any time, or they would be automatically terminated. Oh, terminate, exterminate. Does that mean we're not supposed to be in here? Huh? This, nobody's supposed to be in here. They get terminated. <clears throat> There's a light back there, yeah. Oh. Getting dark. Dark, dark, dark. It's amazing how much footsteps those mics pick up. My name is George. I have worked in the mining industry for 44 years. 26 years underground for Colonel Gee and 18 years in surface coal mining for the Lee Ranch Mine. The machine you see here is a jack leg. It drills by hammering and it rotating the bit. It is fired by compressed air and uses water to wash the cuttings away from the bit. The water passes through the center of the drill steel to the bit. This type of drill is used bit. to drill glass holes for various faces of the mining process. The telescopic leg attached to the drill assisted the miner by forcing the drill steel into the hole as it was advanced. By adjusting the flow of the air to the leg, a constant pressure was applied to the drill bit. The average rate in the rock you are looking at is about 20%. Please note the roof jack located near the machine. It must be placed within six feet from the driller. This was for the safety of the miner as vibrations from the drilling operation would sometimes describe slabs or rock that could seriously injure him or her. Did they have her miners? I don't know. I didn't work there. Oh. But I'm in there now. Well, you'd be screwing around touching the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Yate, my name is Tom Yate. Yate. If it was a real I mine, I would not be there. the uranium mining industry for 29 years. Most of these years were put in at Church Rock Mine Site near Gallup, New Mexico. Bed drifts were driven to provide a means of discharging contaminated air from the active working places or to provide fresh air to a particular part of the mine or working places. I like that guy. He kept it very short, uh -huh. to the point, and then he stopped talking. <laughs> he also greeted you and Dene. My name is Bill. I've spent that all day. my working life, uh, all in uranium, mostly here in the Grants area. You're now at Station 8. The holes you see here were drilled with a yeah. jack leg drill, uh, one of which you saw at Station 6. Then the holes are loaded with explosives and primed with electric blasting caps. Typically, the caps were placed inside a stick of dynamite which was shoved to the end of the hole with this wooden stick you see in the corner. And the rest of the hole was filled with ammonium nitrate. The blasting caps were timed to explode in a certain sequence, causing the drift or tunnel to be advanced to the depth of the drilled holes, usually about six feet. Please note the middle hole at the top of the drift is drilled uh, about two feet deeper to be used as a pinhole. This was so the miner would have two feet of hole to insert a short rock bolt and a cable pulley to remove the ore from the blasted face using the slusher you will see at the next station. The long hole drill in the drift opposite the loaded round is an air-driven rotary extension drill machine and was capable of drilling 300 feet or more into the rock overhead. The primary purpose of this drill was to delineate the overhead ore body. After a series of fan holes, a Geiger counter uh, was inserted to the full extent of the hole and the grade or concentration of the uranium was logged on a chart. 
This information was plotted on a map by geologists who then calculated the available pounds of uranium in this particular ore body. Notice the safety jack located behind the machine. The long holes drilled by this machine also drain water from the rock overhead, improving the ability to recover the ore and create a much safer working environment. Normally, the host rock in which the uranium was deposited was generally very wet, causing the rock or ground to be unstable and unreliable. Great news for a miner. Mm -hmm. That's why I wouldn't be down there if it was mm. a real miner. <clears throat> okay. My name is Ray, and I've been working in the uranium mining industry for 30 years. Remember the subject round with the loaded holes? The face you see here with the scraper in it is a result of the blasting of the six foot round observed at the previous station. Note the shear block hanging from the rock bolt in the back of the knee face. The drills we have observed so far were driven in the ore body to block out the ore into pillars which averaged about 35 feet square. The drills were created by drilling and blasting as seen earlier. The drifts were marked out with the two drum slushers seen here and the scraper that you see in the end of the drift. The broken material was pulled into the race using the scraper where it was dropped down and stopped by the gate on the steel chute you saw in the haulage drift. A grizzly made from all rails is placed at the top of the race. The spacing of the rails was 14 inches to prevent a miner from falling into the race and to limit the size of boulders in the shoe or ore pass. My name is Van. I've been working in and around the mining industry here in the Bronx area since 1960. I would like to tell you a little bit about what you're going to see here in the shop. Working since 1960. In order to keep from having to hoist the equipment to the surface for repair, underground mechanic shops were established for the purpose of performing major repair to the mining machinery. If there were more than one production level in the mine, there was usually a repair shop on each of the levels. Some of the equipment repaired in these shops were slushers, slusher buckets, drill machines, mucking machines, locomotives, and ore cars. Just about anything imaginable was performed by these talented underground mechanics. Please note that the shop has been stabilized by the use of rock bolts and wire mesh to control the ground. There was also an electric shop underground similar to this mechanical shop where the repairs were made to the electrical components. And that's the end of our show. Uh I'm impressed. Alicia would get it. Reminds me of the, the mine car ride at Disneyland. <laughs> lunch room. We should get our lunch out. We have lunch. I left it it's in lunch the truck. Time. It's noon. Noon o'clock. Time for lunch. Hi, my name is Terry. It was. I worked in the uranium mines for over 30 years. The room you have just entered is a typical lunch room. It was used as a central command center for this particular part of the mine. Overall, safety was always a major concern, and safety meetings were conducted here, as well as fire drills and other functions of supervision. Lunch was eaten here with the food often warmed in the gray metal box next to the entrance door. This box, which originally contained electrical equipment, was converted to a warming chamber with the use of floodlight bulbs. It was affectionately called the miner's microwave. To the right of the photos is one of the stretchers that was used in the mines to transport persons to the surface if he or she became injured. This particular stretcher was called a basket. A backboard with straps to completely immobilize a person was also used. The mine is set up for centralized blasting. 
before a blast was set off by supervision, a thorough examination of the check-in, check-out board was conducted. Oh. If a name tag was still on the inside of the board, no blasting would occur until the owner of the name tag was located. This procedure was a central part of mine safety. Some of the equipment a miner used in his daily activities are on display here also. Note the pipe wrench, self-rescuer, battery and cap lamp, and hard hat. The miners were also provided with safety glasses, steel toed rubber boots, and hearing protection. The self-rescuers are required on any underground mine to allow miners to escape in the event of a fire. This concludes the mine tour. It's to a staircase. If you exit through the door next to the miner's microwave and the check-in board, you will be back to the station where you began your tour. Feel free to tour the mine again for a closer look if you wish. The underground activities were constructed with the guidance of miners who worked in the mines and the equipment was donated by various mining companies in the area. The underground portion was all in place before the building was erected over the mine. Please feel free to examine the upstairs portion of the museum, including the minerals in the main lobby and the ancient pottery exhibits in the conference room. Please feel free to ask any staff member for assistance in locating these exhibits. All right, well, that's the conclusion of the mine tour. We'll go back upstairs and head on out to the next thingy. The next thingy. That's right. Well, we just finished our tour of the mining museum in Grants. Toby's got his we're button. We're going over to the El Ma Mal Pais uh, Visitor Center. Oh. She wants me to turn this one. And it's only a few minutes away. Um, so. Let me show you the books that we're working with today. Scenic Driving New Mexico. And At the next stop sign, turn right. Detour New Mexico. And New Mexico Journey Guide. Those are the ones we worked on with today. And we've got a whole bunch of little magazines and brochures from the Mining Museum so we can study up for where we're going to go in the future. And it's time for lunch. Got my and hammy sammy. Turn right onto North Street. Left over North from Street Christmas Central dinner. And apparently Siri thinks she needs to talk at the same time as me. You want Siri, man. <laughs> She's a machine. She can wait her turn. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, well, so... Uh, Paul, briefly, what are the rules? Paul asked, but briefly, what are the rules when doing video in public, public buildings, businesses, and people? Uh, public, outside public, basically the Supreme Court has ruled as long as you're not taking pictures of people and making fun of them, it, you just, you're just recording the activities in the street, uh, you're fine. The same is true for public places, but... Uh, public places that are secure areas, for example, if you're in a place that, uh, like I couldn't record on Kirtland Air Force Base. Um, and uh, some public buildings require, security requires you not to have any cameras. And each one of them, you can fight it if you want. The problem is if they have a sign that says no cameras, no recorders, you have to follow those rules. When it comes to businesses, it's up to the discretion of the business. If they ask you to turn the camera off, you have to turn it off or we don't allow recording. We were uh, we were in a gift shop that had a lot of uh, individual artists work, um, artists and crafts people work in um, Madrid. Madrid. And she asked me if I was recording and asked me, made a copyright speech, but she didn't need to. All you, all they have to do is ask you. So I rarely do it inside a business, uh, but when it comes to museums and uh, visitor centers, things like that, I've never been asked to stop. So uh, as long as you're not using it in like a movie or something right. where you know it's a production, in that case, you do need a materials release. Uh, if it's going to be in some sort of a movie that you're putting together, whether it's for a film festival or if you're charging for tickets in any way for that film, then you have to have some kind of a materials release for it. Right. Uh, the, the best way is 
if you're using it for a commercial production, then you have to have permissions. And there are a variety of permissions from, you know, as Shelley said, location, materials, uh, and in individuals. But public places like museums, uh, we've never had anybody suggest to it. Private businesses, um, if I go in, I'll ask first if it's okay to record. Some people like it. Some people don't uh, prefer that you don't do it. Yeah. Uh, if it's if it's like pottery and stuff, they usually don't have a problem because it's not completely rare. You know, it's right. like a one not one of a kind. Yeah. There's, it's just a type of pottery that they're displaying, and they want people to know more about it. And now we go into a place like this and we promote it and we tell people go there, see mm -hmm. it. It's really cool. It's a great place to be. Um, there are other people who do YouTube videos about, for instance, national parks, and they're making money on their YouTube channel, and they're saying things about the national parks that the people who run the national parks are not happy about, and they're making money. So the national parks can say, ah, you need a permit. Right. So stop doing that. <laughs> we have, there's a, Shelly's referring very distinctly to uh, a YouTube channel called Sin City Outdoors. And it's a dad and his sons, and they just do outdoor stuff. But about, I don't know, six or seven months ago, they started focusing on Lake Mead, um, which is uh, the water level is falling. And so they used to go and show progressively how low the water was getting to the point that it was unearthing boats that had sunk. And then eventually, I think they found uh, six bodies that were stuffed in barrels, you know, kind of mafioso, mafia kind of stuff. Um, and the um, National Park Service finally caught up with it. Not, I don't want to say caught up. They weren't chasing them. But they told them that if you're making money from this production, uh, you, you can't do it without permits. And the permits are two to $300 per day. And it takes up to uh, five months to get a permit approval. And the challenge was these guys are at 250,000 subscribers. So they are effectively generating revenue from their YouTube channel. And the government considers that making money from what you're doing. So yeah. um, there are cautions. Generally, our experience has been that if you if you are uncomfortable with it, ask permission. And if they say no, then don't do it. It's just easier that way. Yeah. So John Miller says, I can't wait to watch the Toby and Shelley movie. The Shelley, it'll be the Shelley and Toby movie. I assure you. <laughs> we have some movies out, but uh, not the Shelley and Toby movie. Yeah, we've done we've done some shorts, we've done some narratives, uh, we've done we've done documentaries, we've done a lot of stuff together. Yeah, we um, just do videos. Okay? Yeah, I, Paul, I wish <laughs> I, I, I could movies. be more clear with you. Uh, simply, it, you just you just it, you know it, you the the the. the I don't know. I don't even know if it's rules and regulations. Yeah. The perception is that you can make people uncomfortable. The Supreme Court has ruled, and this goes back to a case, I think it's in the late 70s, maybe early 80s. And some guy took a picture of the rock and roll, uh, that pyramid-shaped rock and roll museum. And I think Hall it's, of Fame. Uh, the Hall of Fame, that's right, in, in Cleveland. Cleveland Rocks. Yeah. yeah. And he took it, he waited for a perfect sunset. It's beautifully lit. It's an unusual building in the middle of, you know, a, 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 a Eastern kind of rust belt town. And he took a picture of it, waited for the sunset, and he started printing posters. And uh, so the museum took him to court, um, lost, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, basically, uh, if he's standing on the sidewalk and it is in his view with his camera. It's okay for him to take that picture because that you're not, you're, you're not, you can't protect the uh, public image, right? You're, it's, it's, you're on a sidewalk. They would and, have been better off contacting yeah. the guy, getting a contract with him. Right. And, and using then his percentage. photo and poster for their, yeah. use but giving him a percentage and right. that's why uh street photography which is it came out of new york and there's a lot of great black and white street photographers it was a thing you know henri cartier bresson made a career basically on it um and they used to take the picture pictures of people in the street and uh some of them were were what i would call 
uh, revealing, like the people weren't happy that their picture was being taken. But if they're in the street, the court rules in the favor of the photographer saying like, oh, you're, you're, they're in the street. They're in a public, open public space. Uh, so they can't say anything. Now, I, I don't think in my entire career, uh, no, I'm, I'm going to take that back. Uh, they're in, sometimes in media, mid-eastern countries, Afghanistan, which is not mid-eastern, but especially they're very sensitive to having a, their uh, uh, cameras pointed in their direction. Um, and so I avoided it as much as possible just so I didn't know they can't do anything, but half the people there carry weapons. And so you you have a different kind of caution. Half the people here carry weapons, too. Well, that's too. true. Yeah, good point. <laughs> um, if uh, you want to get sticky about it. <laughs> so uh, if you have any sense that they're going to take offense, the best thing is just to say, sorry, let me walk away. Um, I haven't had to do that much in my career except overseas, mostly in the Mideast, occasionally in Afghanistan. Um, but other than that, I, I don't and, think... Uh, you got to be careful about Native American... Uh, land, Native right. American ceremonies of any kind, always ask permission from the leader before you start doing anything. Otherwise, they can get yeah. pretty upset. Once you're once you're on the tribal land, the Pueblo property, they call it around here, uh, there'll be signs that yeah. tell you what you can do when it comes to photography and videography. Uh, when they have special events, the best thing to do if you don't see a sign is ask. And generally when they have the events, they've learned it's easier for them just to let you take their pictures, you know, pictures of what they're doing. Um, uh, the times that I've done it, I've done it. I've done uh, videography of native Americans in two locations. One was at a powwow that it's an annual powwow that takes place here in Albuquerque. And I shot some stuff for my son. He needed, he needed footage for it and th they were open to it. I mean, they, they're, now those there mixed were, powwows where right. they invite the public in. Right. Those are usually fine. Hundreds it's when of, they have private ceremonies, they don't want. And the other thing too, is because everybody carries a cell phone with them, you can't stop everybody from making videos. I mean, that's just kind of the rule. That's why uh, rock and rollers have gotten, they're, they're past arguing whether or not you take a picture of their, uh, or you live stream their uh, concerts. <laughs> it's not worth the fight. Um, the other places we, we went to a Native American dance in um, uh, Land Lander. Lander? That's how it's Land yeah, Lander. Lander. Yeah. Yeah. Lander, <laughs> Lander Wyoming. Uh, we were up there looking for the treasure. Ran and something. <laughs> they had uh, Thursday evening uh, dances and I asked permission. I made sure I asked permission. On the other hand. Well, again, that was a public event right. that anybody could come to. On the other hand, uh, one time it was a beautiful fall and I was on the Rio Grande and I wanted some drone footage of the sunset, the fall colors, the mountains in the background. And I didn't know it, but I was uh, flying over Laguna Pueblo land and a sheriff drove up uh, on me uh, that I didn't, uh, I didn't see him until he actually drove up. And he drew the weapon, pointed it at the drone, which he wouldn't have hit anyway because he was drunk. But he said, bring, get your drone down here. Or I'll shoot it out of the sky. And I said, what's up? And he said, you're, uh, you're on tribal land. And I brought it straight down by that time. By the time I got it down, there were uh, three other cars there. Uh, and there was a younger Native American sheriff uh, that asked me for my ID. You could see the disabled veteran plates on my truck and said, I didn't, you know, inform them that I didn't have any charges. You know, I didn't have a record of any any things. And he said, what were you doing? And I said, I wanted to get the, the fall colors. And I said, why is everybody so upset? It turns out that uh, people had used drones to look for burial sites and things like that, that they could raid. Uh, and so uh, that, that got me. What, what I did was I, at that time, uh, the controller that I had, the remote controller that I had used a phone as your way to see what the drone was doing. And I showed them uh, how I erased all the images on the phone. Um, and so just be careful, especially if you're on in another country or on Indian land, uh, you know, ask permission. Right. For the most part, though, uh, we don't have any problem 
we'll go into every place and just, you know, be friendly and yeah. speak highly of the place. And usually they'll want you to come yeah. in and, you know, promote Those folks, their, promote their So you shot, saw that Shelly was hand carrying one of the action cams. I had the chest cam on and you can see that they're on because there's a screen on the front of them. And uh, there was a point at which uh, the younger of the two women asked you, right? She asked, are you guys... Oh, right. Still, she said, are, do you have a YouTube channel? Yeah, do you have a YouTube <laughs> channel? And that's usually the that's what we usually get. That's usually what they'll ask. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a YouTube Almost channel? Almost all the time they'll yeah. ask. Somebody will ask us. Yeah. It's are funny. Are you on YouTube? Do you have a YouTube channel? Is it's, that why you're doing this? What's really funny is sometimes we'll say, yeah, we're in New Mexico day trips. And they go, oh, we've heard of you. Yeah, we've heard oh, of you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've heard of you. Like, we only but, have but that's It's funny because as soon as they say, are you, do you have a YouTube channel? I'll say, you've just asked the secret question. I yeah. pull out a business card and... Here's your prize. <laughs> we do we do have a business card that we give out to people. Um, we get a lot of people that just want to know uh, not not what we're doing. They don't ask it that way. They'll ask, or are you guys doing something for your channel? Or they, they seem to know that, you know, when you're loaded with a chesty, Shelly's carrying a camera. Um, and, uh, and we both have those microphones that have the little furry mice on them. Um, windscreen. Windscreens. They know you're they're you're doing something, and p people are it's it's actually yeah. a good conversation. It's a starter. little bit. It looks a little uh, you know a little bit professional. Yeah, we got then that we many cameras going all at once, <laughs> and our matching <laughs> that's matching true baseball caps. That is true. We get we've got our matching vests, and people are like, oh, I like your vest, and yeah. we get the you know now we have the Roadrunner patch, and on we've got shoulder. new patches that we're going to put on from El Mal El Mal Pais. Pais. and El Moro. Oh, no, this one is from El Malpais. Yeah. But that was the other point I was going to make. So there's uh, uh, not only is there El Malpais, which is what we're going to do next week, there's another national monument down there called El Moro. And I want to say that's the one I keep telling you guys I want to save to the spring because we want to go up on top of the, the bluff because there's an ancient Pueblo up there uh, of which they've partially excavated. Uh, but at one time it supported over a population of over 4,000. Um, there was water in the area. Yeah, because there was water in the area. I think there so. still is a little. There is. We even saw some of it. They mentioned that in the sandstone uh, when we were. You'll see yeah, next week. Green water. Yeah, uh, yeah. the uh, sandstone bluffs have the soft sand. It's, well, soft. It's it's softer than granite. Uh, but what happens is that either holes were worn in the top, or they'd cut holes in them. They'd chip out holes with them, and they used them to collect water. And uh, the one that we saw at the Sandstone Bluffs had ice in it. So we have a picture of that that we'll show you, share with you next week. So, all right. Anything else? Hope you enjoyed this one. We, as usual, strongly recommend that uh, if you find the time, please go to the uh, New Mexico Mining Museum and Grants. It's very informative. It's got a little bit of... They could really use the, uh, the tourism, although it's extremely cheap to go there. Yeah. Uh, and they had the park right there if you want to, you know, have a little picnic or take your kids. Yeah. Uh, it's a great place for kids to go down in that mine. It's built for, you know, families to take tours. As a matter of fact, there was a family coming down as we were leaving. So. Yeah. Um, and Grants isn't exactly the, you know, it's not Las Vegas. It's a small town. But it's only an hour, hour and a half from, from Albuquerque. Albuquerque. So, yeah. And between, I mean, you could spend a weekend doing... The Mining Museum, uh, El Malpais, and the El Moro, uh, you know, plus a, a trip up to, if you're a rock hound, a trip up to the sides of Mount Taylor is like a rock hounder's dream. Um, mm. So, and I've also been told there's uh, uh, placer gold up there oh, as well. Oh, not only so, that, but the volcanoes in the area are highly studied because they're, there's such a huge variety of volcanoes volcanism in mm -hmm. that area that uh, people go there all the time to study volcanoes. So it's apparently quite an unusual mm -hmm. area for yeah. the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, volcanologists, right? Is that what they call them? Volcanologists. Mm -hmm. Or Vulcans. You know? Vulcan. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Yeah, that's it. All right. All right, guys. We hope you enjoyed today's show. I have put up, uh, accidentally, I put up the <laughs> video alone. Uh, so it's just the video, the mine visit. And also I'm going to put up a separate video of just the mine tour, uh, you, I, just being down inside the mine. So you'll have that access uh, to that as well. Let us know if you have any questions, put them in the comments box below. If you don't have anything else, 
We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us tonight. Let me uh, turn off the banner here and then go to Brian and then go to end broadcast. Thanks for joining us tonight. We love you.